Well, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, it's really an honor uh, for me to be here today uh, at the Clinton School. I saw the list of, uh, of folks that have spoken here before, and you know, I'm, I assure you I'm way at the bottom of that list. There are some quite distinguished people, although my colleague from Pennsylvania, Tim Murphy, Dr. Tim Murphy, was here, so I figured I'm a good company at the bottom of the list. Um, it, it's really good to be here. Again, it is, is an honor. Uh, I thank the university and the school for, for having me, inviting me, and thanks to my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Tim Griffin, uh, for inviting me. Uh, Tim is, uh, as mentioned, on the Ways and Means Committee, and I serve on the steering committee. That's the, the body in the House that votes on who gets to be on the committees. And I can tell you that, that Tim is, not only is he smart, hardworking, he's charming too, as everybody knows, but he's relentless. And when he was running for that position on, uh, on Ways and Means, it's, a, it's an internal campaign. I, every time I turn around, there would be Tim, you know, hey, Schuster, can you support me on this? And so, so I did uh, because I know that he's one of those guys. He's smart. He's hardworking, as I said. He's also one of those people in our conference that, that when he stands up to speak, he has something that's important to say. And a lot of the times, it's about how we need to pull together to get things done. Because sometimes in our conference, uh, you know, there's 240 so of us, and it's like herding cats, but uh, uh, Tim's a voice of reason, Tim's a voice of encouragement, and he's really been uh, a great uh, member for the folks here in uh, the Second District of Arkansas, and for the state of Arkansas, and for our nation. So, so Tim, I appreciate all you do. Uh, you're on Ways and Means now, so you can, you can slow down with me a little bit. Uh, 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 until it comes time to figure out how do we fund uh, these, these different modes of transportation that we have to, have to fund. Um, so, again, being here at the, uh, at the Clinton School is, is great for me. Uh, as mentioned, uh, my family goes back to uh, public service. My father served in the House. He was the chairman of the Transportation Committee. And, and the special link uh, that he has to President Clinton was that they passed T21 in 1998. The president signed it. And so President Clinton uh, understood the importance of, uh, of infrastructure, worked with my father with the Republican majority. And in fact, my father told me a story as he was traveling around the country uh, trying to pitch his idea on the transportation bill. He went to the, or the, excuse me, the governor of Kentucky was a Democrat. And the, guy, the governor said to him, I, I don't know, you know, President Clinton might not be for it. And he said, well, you talk to him and see if you can be in support of this bill. So the governor went to President Clinton and he reported back to my father. And President Clinton told the governor of Kentucky, said, Schuster's never going to pass that transportation bill. Sure, you can be for it. You can be strongly for it. So. 18 months later, President Clinton signed the bill into law. So, uh, so uh, again, uh, Schuster's and Clinton have a, have a relationship. I've met the president a couple of times, and it's amazing to me uh, how he can recall. He would recall details of, of negotiating with my father and dealing with my father. So, again, it's great to be here, especially uh, President Clinton and his speeches would talk about uh, his pledge to build a bridge to the 21st century. So here today I am talking literally about building bridges. So, so again, uh, I'm in good company. Uh, three things I really want to talk about today is, is the federal role of transportation, uh, the importance of transportation to the economy in our nation, and uh, my philosophy as, as the chairman and, the, and what we have on the agenda for the committee to, uh, to move forward. And first, as I like to start off all my speeches when I talk to, to people, especially when I talk to my colleagues, is the fact that there is a role uh, for the federal government in the transportation system. It's not, the federal government is not to do it all, it needs to be in partnership with the state and local governments. But to build a national transportation system requires the national government to have a role. And throughout our history, it has. And in fact, the reason we have the Constitution that we have today, I believe, uh, in, in big part, is due to transportation issues. The, the Articles of Confederation had a number of problems with it. But really, the tipping point or the breaking point with the Articles of Confederation is when Virginia and Maryland, a Virginia led by George Washington, tried to negotiate a treaty to navigate the Potomac River and to build a system of canals and portage roads to get over the Allegheny Mountains in western Pennsylvania to go into the Ohio Territory, which is rich in resources. So they came together, they negotiated, and they failed. And when they left those negotiations in Annapolis, the final negotiation, they realized that the Articles of Confederation aren't enough for us to build a nation, to build commerce, to connect this, this country physically by a transportation system. So they went back to the drawing board, and they came up with the Constitution that we know today. And while they were debating these issues, you know, one of the great philosophers that all the Founding Fathers leaned on and learned from was Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations, the Invisible Hand of the Market. 
But one of the things that uh, he also said that our founding fathers latched on to was that the government should do three things for the people. It should provide them with security, preserve justice, and erect and maintain infrastructure to promote commerce. And so those are the three things. When you look at the Article 1, Section 8, it talks about commerce, uh, uh, defense of the nation, and uh, establishing post roads. So our founding fathers understood that, and that's why I believe they produced the Constitution. Then as you, as you uh, uh, move forward in our history, uh, the major infrastructure that, was, uh, that the federal government supported, encouraged, uh, and legislated on, uh, the first uh, being the National Road, which I'm proud to say goes right through my district, uh, from Baltimore, Maryland, all the way out to Illinois. And uh, we just celebrated the 200-year anniversary of the National Road going through my part of the district. Uh, actually, wasn't completed until all the way to Illinois until the late uh, teens, 1818 or 1819, something like that. But that National Road was important, and it was it was the uh, under the Jefferson administration it was authorized, and under the Madison administration it was appropriated for, and so they they began to build the road. And again, once opening up the West. Uh, it was key to national trade. It was key to s expanding uh, our trade and stimulating settlement in the West. In fact, when you look at the road as it was being, after it was being built, uh, from 1920 to 1940, uh, Indiana's population quadrupled. And uh, many uh, came on the National Road to settle in Indiana. Uh, town building was stimulated the, from in 1827. Indianapolis was the only town between uh, Centerville and Terre Haute, which is 125 miles. But during that eight-year period, there were nine towns that were established along there. So we started to populate the West, and villages and towns started to grow. Uh, in addition, uh, it helped with the, our infrastructure has always helped in our industrial uh, strength and building our industrial base. Uh, from 1820, the economy s expanded. Um, consistently, and the returns were remarkable for the long-term bull market that it created with, uh, again, towns growing up, the industries being started, and commerce being able to flow back and forth because of the, because of the national road. Uh, and that growth, uh, again, allowed raw materials to get to the uh, industrial sites to be able to manufacture, and of course, goods uh, to be getting back to the marketplace uh, so people could buy them. Uh, and in addition to the national road, you had the invention of the steamboat, which helped up and down the rivers, not only moving commerce, but people, uh, building thousands of canals uh, that we built, and of course the railroads uh, really changed the, the face of the United States. And, uh, and when I, railroads started in about the 1840s or so, but really the, the Transcontinental Railroad is what transformed this nation. Uh, and it was started, I like to remind folks, in the middle of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln realized that if we were gonna become a great nation, we had to connect the coasts. Uh, and the railroads were the way to do it. So they set forth during, during, the, uh, during the Revolution, or excuse me, the Civil War. And it's what really ushered in the, the Gilded Age in America, which uh, rapid development, economic development, uh, created a national market uh, to be able to, uh, to mass produce and, uh, and get those goods to and from uh, America. Uh, it stimulated immigration, urbanization, people, our cities started to grow because they were able to uh, put plants in place that were able to mass produce, drive down the cost of, uh, of the, uh, the products that they, were, uh, that they were producing. And it actually it took America from sort of a, a middle, middle class economic power to in 1894 as we were the top three economic power in the world, uh, and large, largely due to the, to the railroads because they were absolutely vital uh, to, our, to our growth. And they allowed for, as I said, national uh, centralization operations that minimized or maximized efficiencies that able to get those, uh, those products around the country efficiently. Uh, and then, of course, in the early 1900s, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, his idea, he was the, the force behind the Panama Canal to be able to cut down the shipping time to get our goods from the East Coast to the West Coast and, of course, from the West Coast to the East and then out into the European markets and the Asian markets. Uh, so that helped us tremendously uh, when it came to, uh, to seafaring and what we were able to put into the world economy and eventually starting to grow into a, to a global power. And then in the 50s, Ab or not Abraham Lincoln, uh, I, uh, an another great American, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, he, with his experience that he saw in Germany about how the Germans had this road system, they could move their troops and equipment very fast and efficiently around the country to defend their nation, but also the economic stimulus uh, that, it, that it provided for that economy. So as he came back and became president, uh, he and, 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 and those in Congress, a Republican Congress uh, for a couple of those years, uh, pushed hard 
uh, for the interstate highway system. And between 1956 and the, the late 70s, they built 90% of the interstate highway system that we know today. And when you look at, uh, at that system, approximately 25% of the nation's productivity increases from, from 56 to 98 are attributable. Uh, to that investment in the highway system. Again, being able to have the flexibility uh, to move things around to, to smaller markets as well as the, uh, as the larger markets. And again, it expanded that domestic market for, for companies. Uh, 1996, the interstate, with just 1% of the miles of public roads in the United States, carried 25% of the nation's surface passenger traffic and 45% of our motor freight transportation. So a tremendous uh, increase. Uh, in, in the ability to our, for our economy to, to expand and move around. Uh, Just-in-time delivery, which in the 80s came to being, was really made possible by the interstate highway system. And, and those modes all working together efficiently to make sure that we could reduce our inventories at our plants and thus in decrease the, uh, the cost of those products that we were able to not only sell to consumers, but to get into the world economy. Uh, the importance of the, of the system, I think uh, it's made aware by the history I've just talked about, but, but I think we all know in our everyday lives, it gets us to work, it gets our children to school, it gets us to visit families, uh, it gets our, our products to and from, uh, from the uh, raw materials to the factory and from the, the finished goods to the, uh, to the stores, and from the stores we are able to, to bring home food and put on our table and, and, our, and, our, and our refrigerators. Uh, so that system needs to be efficient. It needs to be efficient to keep those costs low, not only for us in our domestic market, but for us to be competitive in the world market. And I have a, an example of that uh, as I've been going around the country and talking to the different uh, stakeholders. I uh, came across the soybean producers, and they gave me the numbers that they are the, we're the number one soybean grower in the world, we're the, and our biggest competitor are the Brazilians. And the U.S. soybean grower can move a ton of soybean from Davenport, Iowa to Shanghai, China for $85. The Brazilians, on the other hand, from Davenport, uh, Brazil, wherever that is they produce uh, soybeans, uh, to Shanghai, China, same, same about the same distance, it takes them 141, costs them $141 to move that. So we have a competitive advantage. And while we're sitting here looking at that competitive advantage, we need to understand that the Brazilians are investing $26 billion over the next several years in their water infrastructure. Uh, also, the Chinese are investing into the Brazilian infrastructure because they want to have uh, the soybeans in Brazil to be competitive with the U.S. so that they have a, a competitive market to drive the cost down for the Chinese. Uh, so while they're making those investments, we have to take note that every time they're making a, an investment, it drives the cost of that shipment down. So from, and over the past couple of years, we've seen it go from 141, it'll go down to 140, 138. And ours continues to escalate because of our aging infrastructure in the inland waterway system and our ports. The investments haven't been made. We've got uh, our, our infrastructure is, is on average locks and dams in this country built for 50 years. Our average age is 60 years. Uh, so we've got to take a close look at that. If we're going to continue uh, to remain uh, competitive in the, in the world economy, it's that transportation system that's it's part, of the, uh, part of the equation. In fact, it makes up about 10 percent of the cost of a product is the transportation system. And if it's less efficient, it grows to 11 percent or 12 percent. And if it's extremely efficient, we put efficiencies into it, we want to drive that cost down, again, to make those products uh, competitive. Uh, as I start my uh, tenure as the chairman of the, of the committee, um, I, I looked very hard at Washington, D.C., and it's changed over the years, uh, uh, very much so. And it used to be a power game. Now it's a finesse game. And one of the key skills you have to have, one of the key tools in, in your bag, if you want to be an effective leader, is you have to be a good listener. You've got to go out and you've got to talk not only to the members uh, of your committee, but of your conference and in Congress, but go out across the country, which is I'm doing today. I was in spent some time in Oklahoma. Uh, today I'm here in uh, Little Rock going to meet with the governor today uh, and want to get his ideas and what Oklahoma, or excuse me, what Arkansas has done. And Arkansas has, just recently, the voters of Arkansas raised a, uh, the sales tax uh, dedicated to transportation. So I want to learn from, from uh, the governor and from, and from Tim and others across the state, you know, how we're able to convince the Arkansas voters, the Arkansans, Arkansans? I was in Oklahoma yesterday. I called them Okies. It was easy. Uh, your Arky is here, right? Okay. Is that, is that derogatory? Okay. I don't want to say anything derogatory. Uh, I come from western Pennsylvania. We call ourselves a lot of derogatory things, but, um, 
but uh, so again, it's really important to listen to people, to be able to collaborate and coordinate. Uh, and it's critical to building the consensus you need uh, to pass legislation, uh, big legislative packages, which uh, transportation bill that we, a couple of it I'll be talking about here shortly, we need to do. Uh, and it's about reaching across the aisle, because transportation is, is, uh, is inherently nonpartisan. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I know every town I come to, they've got roads, bridges, some of them have waterways, they've got trains going, they've got airplanes, they, everybody's got cars, bikes. Uh, transportation is something that it's universal to us all. In fact, I look out today and everybody here utilized the transportation system today in this country. And in fact, I was at a, uh, an event in Washington the other night and a gentleman came up to me and he said he was in the pharmaceutical business and he was a distributor of pharmaceuticals and he had 60 trucks on the road. And we're talking about it. He stopped and all of a sudden he said to me, you know what, I'm really in the transportation business. But we all are in the transportation business because we've got to get to and from where we're going. So it's something that's critical uh, to all of us. And that's why, again, going across the country, coming to places uh, like Arkansas, uh, which has, uh, I'm told, uh, a state, not a big state, but you have the 12th most miles, highway miles in the country. Uh, that's a lot of miles for a state with about a little over 3 million people. Um, and, and so your, your highway system is critical to you. And so we want to make sure that we're working together across the country, state delegations, uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, industry, stakeholders, making sure that everybody uh, has their say as we move these bills forward. Um, as I said, um, when you look at, uh, mentioned a couple of the modes here, I, I didn't realize that Little Rock had barge traffic. I looked out my window today and there's a barge coming up the river. I'll be darned. Uh, you guys care about waterways. You care about the airport. You care about the highways. You care about the rail. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've done that uh, Tim mentioned is, is I formed a panel, a special panel, that's going to spend the next six months uh, looking at freight transportation in this country. Uh, the way we're set up in committees, we have a railroad subcommittee, an aviation, a water subcommittee, and they really focus on those different modes in their, uh, in their lane. But I thought it was important to have, to have a look across the modes. How, does, how do the ports and the rail intersect? What's good, what's bad? And then, of course, the highways with trucking, taking, those, taking the, what the train brings the, to the yard to separate it, to get it to, out to the country. And, of course, aviation, the inland waterways, the pipelines, all of them are important modes that uh, they intersect. And I think that's important. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I put Rick Crawford, because of your number of highway miles you have in this uh, state. But also, as Rick uh, uh, let me know, you have one of the highest um, number of miles in, in water system, the water system, whether it's the, whether it's the, uh, the, the Arkansas River or the creeks and streams, floodplains, things like that. Our committee uh, uh, looks at all those types of issues. And so Rick's going to be on, uh, on, that, uh, on that panel. And as we move forward, uh, their job will be to not legislate, but to make recommendations as to how we can improve how the modes connect and how we can improve movement of uh, freight in this country. Uh, but from that, uh, we have three, really three big bills that we're working on. The first will be the Water Resources Development Act, which deals with the waterways, inland waterways, flooding, the ports and harbors of this country. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, we haven't made the investments we need into, those, uh, into, those, into that mode. Uh, our locks are aging. Uh, if you, we were, I was just up in the port of Catoosa in Oklahoma, or Tulsa, outside of Tulsa, and if that port, and there, there's about a 50-50 chance that the locks, one of the locks downriver uh, will shut down, there's about $5 billion worth of commerce that goes in and out of that port, and it's going to have to go to rail or to trucks to get out of there. Um, and some people would say, well, that's fine, but when you, when you put it on a rail road car, it's more expensive than on the water. When you put it on a truck, it's even more expensive than on rail and on water. So it, it's going to elevate the costs. And so that uh, if the grains coming out of the Midwest can't get to down the river uh, on the barges, the least expensive mode, that box of Cheerios that you're putting in your, in your cupboard at home is going to cost you more money. Uh, so we've got to make sure we have a system, as I've been saying earlier, uh, to focus on how we get the system as efficient as possible, which mode at which time is the best, uh, is the best delivery system. And uh, that's what we'll be working on closely uh, on the, on the word of bill and focusing on reform. I know that many of you, if you've been involved with the Corps of Engineers, and Tim and I had this discussion coming out this morning, a lot of times the first thing they say is no, when they should be saying, let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. Let's get it done. And when I, as we travel around the country and hear these stories, there are major shipping country, companies in this country that are spending, investing billions of dollars in ports just off the coast of the United States. For instance, Jamaica, Marisk, the, the, the giant uh, 
seafaring uh, shipper. They've invested $2 billion in the port of Jamaica because they know that the Jamaican government wants it done, so it got done in about half the time with the United States. Uh, the, the government's committed to making sure they're doing their part, and it's close enough to the U.S. market that they can bring those big ships that'll be coming through the Panama Canal. They'll offload them in Kingston and put them on smaller ships and bring them into the ports of the United States. But every time somebody touches cargo, it costs money. Uh, so those it, not coming into the, the port of Houston or the port of Savannah or the port of Los Angeles is going to cost the American consumer more money for that product that they get. Uh, so again, we're going to be looking very, very closely on, on reforming the core and getting those projects done sooner. Uh, the next bill uh, later this year we'll be dealing with is the uh, passenger, passenger Rail and Safety uh, the passenger, and the Rail Road Safety Act. Um, dealing with safety on our freights, which of course are very, very freight, but we want to continue to, to, to make sure that those, uh, those systems are in place, that uh, we can continue to move cargo safely, but also passenger rail. Uh, focusing on passenger rail because there is a need in this country for passenger rail. Maybe not the national system that we see today, but certainly focusing on the corridors in this country uh, that have high density of population. And when you look at the United States of America, uh, we have 300 million people in this country. It took us 65 years to go from 200 million to 300 million, and that, we, that crossed that threshold in 2005. And in 2005, they said it's going to take 32 years to go from 300 million to 400 million people. And we're already seven years into that. And you look at places like the Northeast Corridor, we cannot add another lane to I-95. It's impossible. So we've got to figure out how to improve passenger rail to get people onto trains going up that uh, congested Northeast Corridor and around the country figure out those things. I think if you, if you focus on those corridors that are the most congested, that are most highly densely populated, that organically rail will come back. Because the reason rail, passenger rail, uh, was, in the, was in decline in the, in the 50s and the 60s was because of aviation travel and the interstate highway system. Americans got in their cars and Americans got in planes and flying across the country instead of you know, taking a two-day uh, train ride. So, uh, but with the, the growth of the population, with the congestion we see in 11 or 12 of these corridors around the country, uh, I believe we've got to focus on passenger rail to make sure we reform it and make sure it's efficient and make sure it begins to start to pay for itself may not ever pay fully for itself, but we need to, to not just rely on the government to just slap a check down. We've got to figure out ways those operations can be more profitable. And then finally, we'll look at MAP 21 reauthorization, which is the Highway Surface Transportation Bill, which we dealt with uh, last year. Uh, I believe it was a historic bill because we did a, a significant amount of consolidation and eliminating departments. In fact, uh, nearly 70 uh, uh, programs in the Department of Transportation were either consolidated or limited. We gave states more flexibility, the flexibility to be able to move forward quicker, uh, and time is money. If you're able to reduce these, these, these big highway projects, which average about 14 to 15 years, if you can cut them in half, just the savings from inflation alone, you know, you're going to save 7, 8, 10, 12 percent over that period of time. So a $600 million road job, uh, all of a sudden you're saving 50, 60, 80 million dollars, and that goes a long way. To, uh, to help in states uh, be able to fund other things as well as, uh, as well as the federal government being able to do more with the, the limited resources. And finally, when it comes to MAP 21, trying to figure out how we, we fund it. Uh, and as I've said a number of times, I don't rule anything in, I don't rule anything out. I think we've got to consider everything that's on the table, all the tools available to us, uh, what the American people will tolerate. I know here in Arkansas, the folks, uh, as I said, voted for that half a percent sales tax. They understood that uh, if they want to have a good, efficient transportation system, they've got to make those investments in it. It's going to reduce their, their time uh, in traffic. It's going to reduce uh, the, the, the cost of products on the shelves. And it's going to make Arkansas a more competitive place uh, to draw industry in, to create the jobs uh, that, that, that folks want, the good paying jobs that folks want. So uh, again, that's going to be something we're going to be looking at very closely as we go down the road. New ideas, old ideas, uh, anything that, uh, that uh, makes sense, we want to, we want to take a look at. Uh, as a small business, former small business owner, I, I entered public service knowing full well uh, the importance of, of the transportation system, an efficient transportation system, and the importance of making sure that uh, our infrastructure is strong. I was an automobile dealer, uh, so it, you know, my, the cars that, of course, went onto the highways, but getting by there by, by truck and getting to the, the truck to get it from, from places where the, the trains uh, dropped it off, we knew full well, and making sure that, that they came efficiently helped to, to keep our costs down. 
Uh, I want to have an, a positive impact when I came to Washington. And, and when I looked at what committees do I want to serve on, uh, I looked at a couple of them. You know, Ways and Means is obviously a, a great committee that deals with extremely important uh, issues. Uh, there happen to be uh, two Pennsylvanians on Ways and Means, and I can count, and they're not going to put a third Pennsylvanian. I looked at the Appropriations Committee and had the same situation, two Pennsylvanians. So, so as I, I looked and I started to think about Congress again deeply in the Constitution, uh, the two committees I serve on are transportation and armed services, the two places that I believe that there's no, it's clear to me, uh, those are the, the things that uh, the founding, two of the most important things the Founding Fathers wanted us to, uh, to focus on. So, so that's, that's where I sit and, and that's where I do a lot of my work. Uh, again, traveling across the country, talking to Tim, talking to Rick, talking to your governor today, listening, coordinating, collaborating, making sure that when we move the next transportation bills through that, that the public voice is heard. Again, talking to the stakeholders, the trucking companies, the rail companies, the people that ship, uh, making sure the folks uh, that care the, deeply about the environment, we, we talk to those folks to make sure that their, their voice is heard. But if America is going to remain competitive, we've got to make sure uh, that we have this transportation system that's second to none, that can move things around efficiently. And uh, I think we, we have to be successful. In fact, we must be successful uh, because I believe our economy, our, the prosperity of America depends on it. And if we want to continue to be uh, not just the greatest country in the world, but the greatest country in the history of the world, we've got to make sure we're doing the right thing to keep commerce moving and keep creating jobs uh, for the American people. So again, it's, it's a great honor for me to be here today. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I am happy to take, uh, take questions. If, uh... Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have time for we have time for questions. If you'll raise your hand, yes, we, microphone will come right over here. Okay, first of all, Congressman, thank you so much for coming. This has been enjoyable and enlightening. I have two quick questions. With the changing weather patterns, it looks like we're going to have flooding on the Mississippi River again. Uh, to what extent is weather going to um, be a more important consideration in transportation? And what is the current status of Interstate 69? Well, obviously, always weather is always a, a big contributor, uh, positive and negative, to the uh, to the transportation system. I I know that I've seen that uh, that there there may be uh, problems on the Mississippi. Hopefully, the Corps has learned lessons from I guess two years ago when we had uh, terrible flooding uh, in the Midwest. Um, and it's a difficult uh, situation to try to balance how much you let down, how much you keep back for for various other. Uh, a reason so uh, weather always plays a big role the northeast corridor for instance uh, uh, the weather uh, plays a huge role in air transportation uh, the weather when the weather's bad in the northeast corridor it ripples effect all across the country so so we're always concerned about it unfortunately uh, the good lord takes care of weather we just we just get to deal with it um, a second thing on interstate 69 now i don't know which part of 69 you're talking about because i've been on 69 in indiana i've been on 69 in texas and I don't think I haven't been on 69 in, in, in Arkansas, uh, so I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure exactly what the the status is. Okay, yeah. I'm not. I don't know the, the specifics on uh, on on I-69. Uh, I do know that that's a roadway that again stretches from from uh, Indiana all the way down to Texas. Indiana's building it. Texas is wants to build more of it. Uh, so, and you look at a road like 69, and again, I, it goes through about several states, and uh, once that road becomes interstate from tip to tip, all of a sudden the economic development that occurs along that, that, that uh, roadway uh, becomes significant. So it's one of the things that specifically I'm not sure of, but I know that in the next transportation bill we want to pay close attention to, to roadways like 69 that, uh, that folks are clamoring to complete because we know the importance of it, and the nation needs. Because uh, as I said, I go back to that 400 million number. If it takes us 32 years to go to 400 million, it's probably going to take us another 15 or 20 years to go to 500 million. Uh, in this country, there's going to be congestion in this country uh, in future generations that we need to deal with today uh, so that our children and our jan grandchildren aren't looking back and saying, you know, you guys left us holding the bag here. Uh, we, our economy can't grow because you, you've choked it because of the, the lack of investment. Yep. I just mentioned on that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I-69 is, is the one uh, that Jay Dickey spent a lot of time oh, working on, that. and uh, it, for for our purposes, it connects Memphis to Shreveport, and it does go through a lot. And Trent Lott and, and Dickey and a bunch of others were 
fighting on where it would go. And, but it, it does go through a lot of very rural, uh, unpopulated part of South Arkansas in particular as it crosses through. You can already see some signs that say future home, you know, right. and, uh, and you can just imagine what that's going to do to the economic development. But that's, that's probably what she's talking about. I have a, a, a look at similarly, uh, I-81 goes through Pennsylvania. Uh, in, in, in the 1970s, uh, Franklin County, Pennsylvania was a, a very ag, agrar agrarian county that sat between Harrisburg and Baltimore, Washington. There's was about 70,000 people there. Over the last tw 30 years, because of I-81, uh, Franklin County is now the largest county in my district. There's 150,000 people, and it's growing. It's one of the fastest growing counties uh, in Pennsylvania. Unemployment rate's always one of the lowest. And it's because of that, that connection. That, and now the folks are there saying, hold on a second. We don't want too much development. They want to try to keep that, that, rural, uh, that rural feel to the county. But when you build roadways, you know, the people will come and, uh, and bring jobs with them. Jenny, you have a question right here. Morning, sir. Uh, Jenna Rhodes, first year Clinton School student. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, we've recently been learning about the triple bottom line. Um, the what? Triple bottom line, the three-legged stool of sustainability. Uh, in terms of economic sustainability, social sustainability, and then also environmental sustainability. You've spoken to the economic sustainability uh, portion of that equation. Obviously, I believe our country wants to be sustainable in terms of the polls that are coming out. Um, so I was wondering if you would speak to um, how environmental sustainability and climate change and, and all these kind of things that are happening in our, in our world are impacting your decisions about our transportation future. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, uh, we want to make sure that we keep our environment uh, in, in good standing. Um, and I think a lot of what we see today is uh, when we're looking at alternative fuels, uh, some of them I don't think in the short term, wind, solar, are, are viable. I come from Pennsylvania. We found a tremendous uh, amount of natural gas, which burns much cleaner uh, than, uh, than coal and oil. Uh, I think we need to figure out a way to in put the incentives out there for our major trucking fleets. They're all looking at it now. Some of them are starting to make the, the, the turn, but to, 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 to transform themselves into uh, natural gas or liquefied natural gas fleets. Um, there's, again, a lot of interest out there, and it's very expensive. It's, it's expensive for the trucking company to make the conversion, but it's even more expensive for the Flying J's and the truck stops owners to put in uh, facilities to be able to fuel those vehicles. But there's a plan out there uh, by a number of people. Uh, uh, Boone Pickens has been working with Flying J uh, and others to try to figure out how you put the infrastructure in place. It's kind of the chicken or the egg. Uh, so I think natural gas is a tremendous, not only for our environment, uh, but for our domestic economy, jobs, and geopolitically, for us to say, we don't have to depend on the Middle East. We don't have to be so concerned about what goes on in some other parts of the world because of, if uh, something bad happens, it, it disrupts the, the energy supply. Uh, so I think from, a, from an environmental standpoint and, and all the host of other things, uh, we've got to start making that transformation uh, uh, from, uh, from oil to natural gas, and it's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to flip a switch. It's going to take a generation to do it, but we need to start today to do it. Yes, ma'am. That's the, the Pennsylvanian. Yes, thank you. Renovo, Pennsylvania. Pleasure to have you here. Yes, I am a, a Pennsylvanian, a stump jumper from Clinton County. I have a question for you that is of recent concern. It is the aviation industry, of which we have we are doing a reduction of 300 air traffic control locations. How do you suggest securing the safety of our flights in air if we are reducing by 300 the right. amount of air traffic control stations? Well, let me start from the beginning, first of all, that air traffic has gone down over the last several years by 17%, while the number of controllers and folks that work at the FAA has gone up. So right from the beginning, we can look and say, we don't have the traffic, we have the traffic controllers, so there's probably some room in there. But when you go back to it, it is the FAA, I believe, we, my committee's been looking at this very closely, they have the ability, unlike some other branches of government, the FAA has the ability in the air traffic controller organization to move funds around. They have a budget of $7.5 billion. Um, they have the uh, uh, 
2.7 billion is, doesn't deal with people, it deals with functions that, that I believe they can move money around. And, you know, it's buying computers and paper clips and office supplies and contracts and travel and things like that. So they have a significant amount of money that they have, the, and they have the flexibility to move that around. Uh, the next thing you look at, there are 44,000 people that work for the FAA, uh, and 15,000 of them are controllers. Now, it seems to me if you're going to lay furlough people, you first look back to the, to the back office and to places that safety doesn't, uh, is not going to be affected. Uh, so that you've got that to consider. The third thing is what they're doing is they're doing an across-the-board furlough. From the office people to the traffic controller, all look at the same way. Whether it's Chicago, uh, O'Hare, or, or Atlanta, Hartsfield, two of our busiest airports in the country, versus Pittsburgh or Dayton, Ohio, or smaller airports, they're treating them all the same, which is wrong. Um, so they have, I just laid out three or four things, they have the ability to do that. This administration does not want to do that. They want to inflict as much pain on the traveling public to make their point as we go through the summer, moving towards, sequest, or moving towards uh, the debt ceiling debate, they want a very high visibility uh, operation out there that Americans are going to feel uh, delays, and we believe they have the ability today to, to stop this. Uh, the, the airline industry has filed a suit in the federal court to, to put an injunction to stop them from doing that, because uh, it's, it's going to cause a lot, of, uh, a lot of hardship across the economy. And this administration has the ability to have flexibility. And beyond that, tell me a company in this country over the last four or five years that hasn't had to cut four, five, six, eight, twenty percent uh, to, to keep their company uh, floating, to keep their company uh, in, in good shape. Uh, I was recently down in New Orleans and the Democratic, uh, the Democratic uh, go, uh, mayor in New Orleans told me over the last couple of years they cut their budget twenty six percent and he said we didn't have to take much out of the muscle. What we took it out of was things that were reformed, waste, things they didn't, weren't working. So I believe this is a time for the FAA to roll up their sleeves, this administration, to figure out how you perform, how you op better operate uh, these government entities. And I believe there's plenty of money there to be saved. Yes, yes ma'am, you have a question. And the microphone's coming to you. Yes, Dorothy Cox with the Trucker newspaper. Uh, what um, paper? The Trucker newspaper, okay. national newspaper. Um, the American Trucking Association has said that truckers will be willing to bite the bullet and uh, go for a fuel tax because it, it, it's so important to them. Sure. And you said you were going to talk to Governor Beebe about, you know, the question of, of taxes. Is a fuel tax a real possibility? And my number two question is, um, are you working in the, the area of public-private partnerships. How do you, where do you stand on that? Well, I, I think that we still have, we're having this discussion with the American people, with, uh, with com members of Congress. Uh, I don't believe that a uh, raising, uh, for the truckers, for instance, a raising their uh, tax, the user fee they pay, uh, a standalone bill. I think if you're going to do tax reform, major tax reform bill, there may be opportunities there to look at revenue, different revenues. Uh, if you're making the tax code easier, uh, uh, making it, uh, you know, going from the numerous uh, different rates we have now down to two, which we're talking about, uh, taking away some of the, uh, taking away some of the uh, exemptions or loopholes. I think there'll be an opportunity to to look at those those types of uh, revenue uh, enhancers. Uh, but right now, again, and without uh, with, without the the package of a of a major tax reform bill, I don't I don't think it's possible. Uh, and I know the truckers have said that the manufacturers. Uh, have said they'll pay more in, in fees because they know it's important to get their their products to to market efficiently. The Chamber of Commerce has been a huge advocate uh, for figuring out ways to generate funding, uh, but public-private partnerships are are part of that equation. Um, it's we have we increased TIFIA, which is a government loan backed loans to to states to be able to to. Uh, to leverage with their investment. And there's a lot of interest uh, from not only here in this country, but around the world, private sector companies being able to, uh, to get involved in, in transportation infrastructure uh, improvements. Uh, we've got places and ports on this, and that's one of the things we're looking at for reform with the Corps of Engineers. There's a lot of private money, companies that want to dredge and deepen ports in this country because they want to build major facilities, one of them being uh, to, with the natural gas industry, to ship overseas uh, uh, liquefied natural gas. 
Uh, in Texas alone, there's probably about $30 billion worth of investment, much of it sitting on the sidelines waiting for the Corps of Engineers to sign off uh, to do it. So, so there is tremendous uh, interest in there for the, for the, from the private sector to make, to make those investments to, to improve our infrastructure. Harvey right, Joe, you got a question? Mr. Chairman, my name is Harvey Joe Sanner. I live in Prairie County, Arkansas, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I can cut my remarks short by asking you to rely on Ms. Amy Larson at the National Waterways Conference, who testifies before your committee often. Uh, she's got a, a real handle on what we need as far as waterway infrastructure in this country, I think, and she's very supportive of the 12-foot channel that uh, Chris right. and others are. Uh, my, personally, my question is, uh, it seems to me before we can accomplish a lot in the area that you're very concerned about, or any area in Arkansas, we've got to have a different attitude in Washington about earmarks. And I would ask that you would comment on what you think about that, that subject of earmarks, how we're going to change the attitude and get the authority invested back in Congress that they once had to fund these kind of projects that we all need. Uh, if you would, would you please sure, tell sure. us what you thought well, about you know, earmarks? First, first, let me say that uh, earmarks, there were abuses in the past, there's no doubt. Uh, they were overdone uh, in the past, but um, as we move forward with the Water Resources Development Act, and, and Amy Larson, who he speaks about, is one head of one of the uh, associations down there, um, you know, we, we talk about how uh, do you do a Water Resources Development Act. For those folks that aren't, aren't familiar with it, uh, the water resources, the word of bill, it's line after line, Congress authorizing the Corps of Engineers to dredge a port, do a study on dredging a port, rebuilding a lock and dam, uh, re reassessing a floodplain situation. So uh, inherently it's considered an earmark because Congress names it line after line. Last uh, word of bill in 2007, there were over 200 pages. Uh, and it's probably way too many. Some of the things were on there are never going to see the light of day. But really the, the thing that's a challenge, it's a hurdle, uh, is to try to do a word of bill to authorize those projects uh, and retain constitutional congressional authority to do that. Now we can do it in such a manner that we'll say to Congress, we'll say to the executive branch, we'll give you the power to authorize these and decide what, which is going to be or not be. And when we do that, we will effectively give away our constitutional congressional authority to do those things. We'll give it to the executive branch, and we'll never get it back. And we'll never get it back. I don't care if it's a Republican president or Democrat president. I'm not willing to cede one more inch of congressional authority to the executive branch. And we've been done it for, since Andrew Jackson was president, there's been an assault by the executive branch on the legislative branch. And most of the time during national crisis, or even not national crisis, Congress willingly cedes uh, that power to the to executive branch. And so what you have now are this alphabet soup of agencies in Washington, from the Federal Rail Administration to the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, they can put rules and regulations in place without having to come back to Congress to do it. And those are the kinds of things that, you know, I watch a lot of my colleagues stand up and rail against. Well, that's something I don't want to be part of. I want to figure out a way we can do it with transparency, accountability, in the light of day, that anybody can take a look and see that, hey, uh, improving uh, navigation on the Arkansas River is going to be beneficial to the United States. And again, Tim and I were just talking about, if you dredge this from 9 feet to 12 feet, you dredge any river from 9 feet to 12 feet, you'll increase the capacity on that river by 30%. If we can get 30% more on the waterways, the cheapest and most inexpensive mode of transportation, it takes, it'll take about 130, a barge, it'll take 130 trucks off the road, it'll take 16 rail cars off the rail. We're talking about a significant amount of commerce moving up and down these rivers, driving down the cost of whether those commodities or those products get into your, your, your house or whether it's going into the, into the world economy. So, so again, it's a, it's a challenge. And, uh, we're, we're working through the process to try to figure out if we can do that. But like I said, I'm not willing to even Congressman, inch. What, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. In, in the Arkansas River thing, and it's interesting because, you know, in Arkansas, it's known as the McClellan Kerr navigation. In Oklahoma, it's the Kerr McClellan. <laughs> so, so when I you guess had, that was in Oklahoma. Well, it was, they, uh, were one, they, they, they were one, two on. They, 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 they were one, two on Senate appropriations, and so that. Skip, that's why I just said the Arkansas. River. That's right. Well, it's, it's, it, 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 it's fine. It's just fun when you cross, when you when you cross the border. It's perfectly fine. The uh, but my question is, you know, and I and I and I respect the comments on the 
uh, you know, making the river deeper, and I respect the comments on, on them. But it, it seems to me that has, has Congress or have people looked at something, particularly in urban congested areas, that compared to some of these programs, far less expensive, about working with the states and local governments to make cities more pedestrian and bike friendly. Uh, it, would, it would seem to me that that would be a great investment, not only in terms of transportation and environment, but also in public health. Right. Is, there, is there a way that you and the chairman of the, the health and the environmental committees could, with Congressman Griffin's support, uh, look at some possible, I, it seems to me that would be a good thing to look at. Right, well it's already been in there. There's been, there's been a pot of money that's been earmarked for, I shouldn't say earmarked, but designated towards. It's okay, I'm not against earmarks, so that's okay. It, it technically wasn't an earmark, it was designated. It's okay, I'm all right with it. And my, my view of those things are, those things are really locally driven. They should be locally driven. It shouldn't be for, and my, my state's a perfect example. We took out the, uh, in the last MAP 21, the, the, the wording in there that forced the state of Pennsylvania to spend money on bike paths because we've got 5,000 bridges and they're not all big bridges, a lot of them are small bridges that need to be rebuilt, we need to be repaired and so I just think it's wrong for me sitting in the federal legislature to say, oh by the way, you're going to spend some of that money on bike paths but what we did give the governor of Pennsylvania and the state legislature the ability to say yes we will spend or no we've got real problems over here on bridges and we've got to focus on them. So I, I just believe that's something that you know if New York City and Philadelphia and Little Rock want to enhance bike path, then I think they should do it. And I'm not, a, I, and over my years in Congress, I've funded, I've got earmarks for bike paths because I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's wonderful for the economy. It's wonderful for, for citizens to be able to get on bikes and, and improve their health. But again, for me sitting at the federal level, I just don't believe that's our job to say to Little Rock or Arkansas, you will do this or you will spend money. But again, it's not that I'm opposed to, I'm just opposed to the federal government. Let me just say that uh, I have uh, meet with Mayor Stodola, talk with Mayor Stodola about bikes a lot. Uh, I am helping, hopefully I'm helping, not hurting, on a project here locally. I won't go into the details because that may not happen. Uh, but uh, I had lunch with him at Browning's about a, I don't know, a month ago on a Sunday uh, to talk about bike pass. So uh, there are some open, obvious ways to help in things with things like this, such as fund it from the federal government, but there are also ways uh, that I can help without getting more funding from the federal government that in this particular case, uh, hopefully is gonna bring some results. So uh, just because you're not reading on it, uh, reading in the Democrat Gazette that things are going on didn't mean things aren't going on. Uh, and there's a lot of things I don't read in the Democrat Gazette that I'd like to see there. But uh, so it's something I'm working with the mayor on, and uh, I haven't talked to the new mayor in North Little Rock about this particular deal, but it is something I'm working on. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I know there's a lot of other questions, so I encourage you to come visit. We really appreciate you being here.